Bonjour a tous. Welcome to the Lenovela Spree podcast. We are your hosts, Guillermo Moreno. And me, Jeremy Hossader. And unfortunately, uh, Charles was not able to join us today, but it, uh, he will be with us next time. And today's topic, everyone, is the catalyst for starting the La Novella Spree website. As mentioned last time, that uh, for the next topic, for our second episode, was the catalyst itself for the website. And what I mean by catalyst, what we mean by catalyst was the main thing that sparked this, the main thing that uh, prompted us to initiate this endeavor and this goal. Now, um, and we touched on it, we touched on it last time. We, we did touch on it, but if we could go into a little more depth this time, uh, just a little more specifically with our uh, interactions with the alt-right that we mentioned last time. And, and we will go into some more detail about why we're using certain terminology, but it's necessary for the sake of getting certain points across. And, um, well, we will go ahead and go into more detail. But initially, of course, Jeremy had shared about the conversation that he had had with his friends and how they were adopting a hermeneutic of rupture when it came to the Second Vatican Council. So today's topic, yes, the, the main catalyst for La Novella Esprit is radical traditionalism. More specifically, we want to address the Society of St. Pius X, also known as SSPX. And we want to share about our experiences with these rat treads. And one thing that I want to mention briefly, first of all, is the difference between the, the terms trad and rad trad. So a trad is someone who has a devotion to the traditional Latin mass. They, they, they just prefer to go to the Latin mass. Whereas a rad trad uh, short for radical traditionalist, is someone who essentially rejects the everything since the Second Vatican Council that comes from the church. Now, that includes some of the teachings of the Second Vatican Council, and that includes the Novus Ordo, which is the ordinary form of the mass and the extraordinary form that's what we refer to as the traditional latin mass and we can go into more detail on those things but there's a huge difference everyone there's a huge difference and that's why i wanted to elaborate a little bit on the on how in the last episode how right wing maybe wasn't quite the right term but rather alt right as an alternative right so there's this right wing connotation to where traditionalism comes from but at some point it crosses a line of this is not catholic anymore this is something else so jeremy if you could uh please share with us once more or in a little bit of more detail about your experiences with what exactly were your friends right yeah teaching? yes or or proclaiming that Hey, this is a hermeneutic of rupture. This right, is right. not Catholic. So I guess I just want to say, first of all, that um, like when I was studying theology at Franciscan University, took um, class with Dr. Alan Schreck on Vatican II. And probably the most important teaching I learned there in that class it was a three-week summer class and the teaching itself that i took away was not so much the whatever the documents contain as great and wonderful the teachings are of the council but the overwhelming sense that vatican ii is a gift of the holy spirit and in fact that is why my um, very first article on the hermeneutics of Vatican II begins with this fundamental principle that we have to understand Vatican II as a gift of the Holy Spirit. And that 
is precisely what is at stake. If Vatican II is not an ecumenical council, then it's not a gift of the Holy Spirit at the very least. And so you get this dichotomy, this opposition between these radical traditionalists who reject Vatican II as illegitimate, as not possessing authority. But on the other hand, you have the popes who do say, who do talk about Vatican II in terms of being a gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, I remember just talking with these um, several people at Franciscan. I know we've had discussions about this, Guillermo, right? And like they would talk, they would make these arguments about Vatican II that just seemed completely off the wall. And what I mean is they fail to understand that to defend the tradition that they so love, <laughs> you have to defend the council. Mm -hmm. You yeah. have to defend the council. Okay. That, that is correct. That is correct. Now, and maybe what I want to ask you, maybe some of our viewers don't, or listeners, I should say, don't quite know the terms hermeneutic of continuity and hermeneutic of rupture. Can right. you share with us what those terms mean when it comes to the right. Second Vatican Council? So in um, broad strokes, okay, because this is actually a topic that's about 100 pages on the website. Sweet. So if you want to spend about 100 pa some pages reading something, we do have that on the website as part two of the Vatican II hermeneutics. But in short, Benedict XVI in, um, in 2005, his Christmas address said that um, he distinguished between a hermeneutic of reform and a hermeneutic of rupture, which we could also frame in terms of continuity and discontinuity. With Discontinuity, such as the SSPX, they will say that Vatican II broke off from the tradition and teachings of the preconciliar church. So preconciliar as in before Vatican II. So they contrast the preconciliar church with the postconciliar. So postconciliar being the after Vatican II. And so and this is part of this narrative is going to be actually someone who like Taylor Marshall will say that the church is infiltrated by modernness, by Freemasons. In fact, in the 70s, um, Lefebvre accused Saint Pope John or Saint Paul the Sixth. Yeah, so Pope Paul the Sixth. Lefebvre accuses him of collaborating with the Freemasons. This is back in the 70s. So it's been decades that the radical traditionalists are seeing Freemasons everywhere. And this is not to underscore the real danger of Freemasonry, but of at the same time, it, you can't use that to reject a legitimate authority of the pope what i want to add uh jeremy is that rat trads have seemed to um th there it's a lot less it's more challenging to see their credibility if it's there because synonymously just as leftists say that everything is racist like they use the word racist for every little thing even where it's not same thing with uh rat treads they say everything's modernist and like um yeah. no no it isn't it's yeah. not no and uh i just see that that's why and we will talk about this a little in a little more detail how 
when it comes to, I just frequently use the analogy of leftists and rat treads. It comes down to a certain kind of collectivism and it's hard to unwrap your head off of that kind of paradigm. Right. It's easier to right. adopt and it's, it's easier to point fingers and to see the world as us versus them and so forth. Yeah. It's a, uh, Ratzinger calls it a siege mentality. Yes. And that's okay. precisely oh. what um, Vatican II is all about breaking out of is that siege mentality. You mean S I E G E? Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. Yeah, he in his um, theological highlights of Vatican II, which is kind of his um, his own firsthand account of the council, because he was Beautiful. at Vatican II as a paratus. That's a theological advisor. Mm -hmm. When he was there, um, he describes how the how you had this conservative minority that represented kind of a neurosis that they were the besieged last standing bastion of true Catholicism. And you see that mentality play with at work within the SSPX and a lot of these radical traditionalists. They're the ones that are besieged. They're the last ones that are upholding tradition. Yep. They are, they'll call themselves the remnant, for example, one yeah. of those magazines. Yes, man. <laughs> I'm getting frustrated because I will go into detail about why I'm getting frustrated um, later on in the segment. If you were finished sharing with um, what? Uh, yeah. Okay. Just well, we should, we should talk about continuity for a moment. Okay, please. We, we talked about rupture. Yes. So well, we could throw out religious liberty as a good example now. Because on the one hand, a radical traditionalist will look at the Vatican II teachings and mm -hmm. Dignitatis Humanae on religious freedom and say, wait a minute, that contradicts what say pious ninth wrote in quanta cura so because in quanta cura or gregory the 16th mirari boss and many other citations from the 19th century papacies you have all these condemnations of religious freedom and now you have an ecumenical council teaching religious freedom and the radical traditionalists will say aha gotcha now, what we need to understand then is the hermeneutic of continuity. You can have, you have to have continuity in terms of dogma. There, there, this dogma cannot change. Dogma is the infallible teachings of the church that cannot be contradicted. Doctrine is a, it's a lower level of teaching but it's also going to be very hard to contradict because of the type of teaching it is. And we, I spelled this out again in part two, the hermeneutic series, talking about the different levels of teachings. Now, there can be changes. It, there can be reforms when it comes to our historical understanding of a doctrine. And there can be reforms and changes in how we understand something that's a juridical matter such as the debate between the vernacular and Latin use in the liturgy. But what cannot be asserted is a rupture in terms of dogma and authority of the church. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so when we see this apparent contradiction between religious freedom and a statement such as quanta cura versus dignitatis mane, you actually have to understand that religious freedom is being used in different senses. You yes. have to read carefully what is being rejected because the 19th century papacies are rejecting views that are based upon relativism, naturalism, uh, emotionalism. You 
throughout the various isms of the 19th century. And that's how they were justifying religious freedom. And that's not what the church means by religious freedom. Of course not. So what does the church mean by religious freedom? Well, didn't you read Dignitas Mane? I have. I want to say that I have. Well, for our listeners. Okay, fine, bro. (laughs) (laughs) Now, so Dignitas Mane. Real quick, I cannot wait to read your document, your document or your commentary on Dignitas Humane. Oh, yeah. Which is available on our website. Yeah, there's a hundred some pages on that as well. We've been busy writing. Yes. So, yeah, Dignitatis Humanae. In short, what it teaches is that every human person has a duty to search for truth. And in that search for truth demands a search for especially religious truth. And with your search for religious truth, that, of course, is going to come with a duty to participate religiously and so your religious activities is going to require worship it's going to require community it's going to require education and all those things now fall under this pursuit of truth so when we consider religious freedom in this aspect as man's universal search for truth and this moral demand it makes upon us This is a statement that is grounded in the type of being man is as a truth seeker. Mm. St. John Paul II and Fides et Ratio define man as a truth seeker. Man's he who seeks the truth. So when we start with that, then we can begin to understand how the church teaching religious freedom comes into play and dignitatis humane is doesn't claim to answer all the questions it just says the traditional teachings concerning church and state are left intact but then it doesn't comment on that it just says we're going to te- give a true view of what is religious freedom So in the 19th century papacy, you have all these condemnations of false views, and you have these teachings concerning the proper relation between politic and the church. Now you have Dignitas Humani saying, here's a true meaning of religious freedom, and we're going to not comment upon the church-state question. Okay. I was thinking we should probably talk about just who are the SSPX. Do you agree? Um, I do. If I could briefly share my uh, initial oh, experiences. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Definitely. Now, yeah, the um, you had your critics of Vatican II when I was at Franciscan. And as I uh, complained to you at some point that I got to Franciscan University with um, just a, uh, just a below average formal Catholic education. And what I mean by that, I went to public school my whole life. You know, I read a couple of apologetics books, some uh, Jason Everett and Christopher West stuff. And I had a good youth ministry. I, I will say that I, I had a good youth ministry, good youth ministries. You know, and I come to Franciscan at the, at the, at these, um, upper division courses I was I was learning as I was going I was genuinely just learning as I was going at this at this advanced level of theological courses I didn't know about this I I, from experience as I shared I interacted with dissidents on the left I didn't know that dissidents on the right existed we touched on the on the Franciscan but I couldn't quite focus too much on that I was too busy trying to learn covenant you know <laughs> I, I was and yeah but and regrettably i yeah well okay i i that's yeah. my side of the story when it came to franciscan university yeah but yeah it's easy 
to focus on the liberals because oh, yeah. they're the ones who clearly dissent from church teaching. Yeah. They're oh, the yeah. ones who make the headlines, yes. it seems. Yes. And at Franciscan University, I, I interacted at some level with critics of the Second Vatican Council and the Novus Ordo. I, I thought they were just complainers. I didn't think that they were dissenting as well. But right. Right. yeah, and I didn't go into too much detail with them to come to the conclusion that you're not really catholic are you you're you're something else at this point if this is what you believe yeah that the second vatican council is not is wrong basically yeah. if you reject it then i'm sorry you, you are not catholic i yeah. couldn't I, didn't, I hadn't come to that conclusion my first actual interaction was when you invited me to follow the page that you were following that your friends had established had had them oh, yeah. found it yeah and that's when you know after just some of the things that they were saying i was like this doesn't sound right and then at some point i learned about sspx i just want to share about this post that they posted on facebook shortly after and it was obviously in honor of well not in honor of but in light of uh, Roe versus Wade, the anniversary of Roe versus Wade. Around yeah. that time, they posted on Facebook, if you have had an abortion, you should be deported. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was <laughs> shocked to see that. I was yeah. so shocked. It kind of, okay, they just, they they really yeah. put everything in perspective for me. And I, I commented saying theocratic propaganda at its finest. Yeah, I don't remember that. Yeah, and then they said, "Can you define? Can you can you describe what you mean by theocratic propaganda?" And I said, "I could write a book on it, and that's what <laughs> I'm working on. That that that's what this is. And yeah. we could we, we let's talk a little bit of mo- a little bit more about that, um, yeah. and just piggy basically yeah. piggybacking off of that. And I do have one more in person experience, as I am sure many faithful Catholics. Okay, we have these." these battles on Twitter, on Facebook, in social media. When does it ever happen in person? It happened to me once. If we have time, I will share with that. I will share that, but let's go ahead and proceed with, okay, well, what is radical traditionalism? Then, all right, it, it, we can say, of course, that it started with the Society of St. Pius X. Yeah. So who, who are they? Who are they? Who was their founder? That's what I want us to go over today. Right. So let's see here. Marcel Lefebvre was born in 1905. He died March 25th, 1991. He was the founder of the SSPX. Um, so... He was, he had joined the Holy Ghost Fathers and he worked in West Africa for 30 years prior to Vatican II. So he was a missionary priest, um, eventually with the Order of the Holy Ghost Fathers. He was elected their superior general in 1962. So this is right before Vatican II. Now, during Vatican II, um, Lefebvre, you know, he was, he was at some point made um, a bishop course so that's how he participated at vatican ii all the bishops were um invited to come to the council he of course went along with two thousand plus other bishops from around the world truly Mm -hmm. a immense gathering and during the council he led a minority group that was ultra conservative and tried to block a lot of the reforms of the council they they wanted to preserve um this kind of siege mentality that we noted before marcel lefebvre was a very much embodiment of that mentality so after the vatican council I'm going, I guess I would just speculate that he probably felt defeated in some respect, you know. You spend all these years trying to advocate for your view and then the council doesn't follow you and the majority of the bishops also don't follow 
what you argued for. So I'm sure that had to be weighing on him psychologically. Mm. In 1968, um, he had to resign from the Holy Ghost Fathers because he refused to implement reforms from Vatican II. And afterwards, he had a lot of requests to start a seminary to train young seminarians in tradition. Um, so November 1st, 1970, he formed the Priestly Society of St. Pius X and established a seminary in Econ, Switzerland. Um, the charter for this establishment was a six-year charter. It was called a Pia Unio, which means it was essentially a experimental charter for lay associations to see, just kind of an experiment to see how is this thing going to play out? Is it going to be something that bears fruit? Right. So given the status as a Pia Unio, this would imply that the SSPX was not originally established as a religious institute, but as a lay initiative. And that's actually one point of debate between the SSPX apologists and the people who, in the canon lawyers concerning the status of the group. So, you had something you want to say, Guillermo? I was just going to clarify. So they didn't start off as a, uh, say, like a, a different religious order, like the Franciscans and Dominicans. Oh, no. Okay. No. They, they were essentially just a, kind of an experimental lay group that started out as a result of um, seminarians coming to Lefeb and asking if he could train them in some way so they can become priests in a traditional order. And um, so between 1970 and 74, we have friction arise between the French cardinals and the SSPX seminary in Switzerland. And this was part of, part of it was the fact that the French seminaries were not getting seminarians, whereas Lefebvre's seminary was growing. And we have um, these significant cultural differences. So there's this quote here by Father Daniel Oppenheimer about the differences. He was a SSPX priest who rejoined the church. And he wrote, quote, by 1976, Lefebvre's society had come under open attack, particularly by certain members of the French Episcopacy. Central to the complaint was the continued use of the old Roman liturgy in his canonically approved seminary, now located at Econ, Switzerland, that this same seminary was bulging at the seams with clean-cut young Frenchmen wearing cassocks when the seminaries in France were depleted of all but a few seminarians now sporting blue jeans and long hair in the anti-clerical mode of the day did not help the widening gulf between the two sides, end quote. So we can see on the one hand kind of motivations for why some of these radical traditionalists would say, look, the reforms of Vatican II produce bad fruits because you got essentially these hippie priests walking around and who wants to be a hippie priest? No, I want to be this macho Cossack wearing seminarian, right? Mm -hmm. And so naturally young men are going to be drawn to one of those and not the other because who wants to be a dirty hippie? It's not inspiring whatsoever. So and this, of course, this friction leads to a canonical visit by two priests. And there, there's some controversy concerning that yes. visit. Um, at the very least, we can say Lefebvre questioned their orthodoxy concerning some things they had said. And he issued a public declaration on November 21st 1974 now 
this declaration was important because it became the catalyst of the for the um i guess the struggles between lefebvre and the magisterium because in here he explicitly challenges the authority and legitimacy of both vatican ii and pope paul vi and we can read a little bit of that public declaration so for example he says quote we refuse on the other hand and have always refused to follow the rome of neo-modernist and neo-protestant tendencies which were clearly evident at the second vatican council and after the council and all the reforms which issued from it end quote or also a little bit later on he says quote no authority not even the highest in the hierarchy can force us to abandon or diminish our catholic faith so clearly expressed and professed by the church magisterium for 19 centuries end quote so here in these quotations you have this um, dialectic between the modernists who instigate the reform the cause of that was vatican ii you have the pope who is supposed to be continuing and enforcing this modernist reform and versus Lefebvre, who is the defender of 19th centuries of traditional church teaching. And he's going to appeal to church tradition over against authority, because he's, as he said, not even the highest authority in the church can compel him to abandon his views. And this is in 1974. So something that I'm taking from this is the fact that you have, it almost seems like you, there's this, in their view, this rupture between tradition and authority. And push comes to shove, you reject the authority. Yeah, there has to be, in some respect, a corruption of that authority since now you have the papal authority being used to promote what they claim neo-modernist tendencies, neo-Protestant tendencies. That's a lack of faith in the church authority. Yes, yes, it is. You know, um, there's critics who critique the idea that Lefebvre was the Luther of, of um, the last century, you know, I fail to see how that's not the case right. for someone to say like, no, 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 this, this is the right way to do it. And the authority they're they're wrong. Right. Therefore where here's what we are going to do. Yeah. You know, like, how is that not what Luther did and how, what, what Lefebvre set out to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen a po um, Lefebvre apologists say that Lefebvre is really the modern St. Athanasius. Ew. St. Athanasius is the most famous for standing up against Arius at the Council of Nicaea, defending the dogmas of the Trinity. And for that, he was like exiled and persecuted because the, a lot of the, there was a majority of the bishops at the time who were Arian followers of areas mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so they like to compare that situation with lefebvre as a new athanasius and the difference is athanasius followed the authority of the church he followed the authority of the pope lefebvre did not do that lefebvre is declaring open war right here in 1974 like not even the highest authority of the pope can compel me to change my views right and look, I'm glad that you brought up Taylor Marshall because I listened to him. You know, I don't, I don't, I I was listening to one of his interviews with an SSPX priest where, okay, allegedly, allegedly, you had these visitors from the Vatican go see what Lefebvre is doing with the seminary. They report back to the Vatican. And after some back and forth, I believe between Lefebvre and Paul VI, that Paul VI was led to believe that Lefebvre was having a seminarian swear an oath against him. 
and that Lefebvre was was shocked that this was the case. Nonetheless, you have this open declaration, as you said, it, like okay, yeah. we're we're basically declaring war. Yeah, and and okay, this is what prompted them to shut down the seminary. That would that prompted yeah. the authority to shut down the seminary. Yeah, I I can't comment as to the veracity of that story about yeah. the pledges. I do find that to be a very interesting um, piece mm -hmm. of information. Yes. One thing that I want to add before we continue is I just don't think that rat trads know what they're saying when they use the word modernist. Again, yeah. like leftists, they don't really know what they mean when they say racist. Same thing with, yeah. with rat treads and, and you no know, modernism, it has its meaning. And just because you say something's modernist, that doesn't make it so. And right. that's, a, that's a conversation right. that we should go into as well. Yeah, but, no, but, there's a whole encyclical that goes over various meanings of modernist. Interesting. Yeah, so that that is certainly a worthwhile interesting um, thing to look into. Yeah. I, I forget offhand what it is, but it it was an encyclical right around 1900 that came out. Okay. That was that condemned modernism and it worked through categorically different meanings: the modernist as a theologian, the modernist as a philosopher, yes. the modernist as biblical critic, modernist as historical revisionist. I mean, it works through it thoroughly. So. There is a clear meaning that, in short, we can say it's a rejection of doctrine as something that is necessarily true for all time, right? It undercuts the truth value of truth itself as something that is necessary. So in other words, whether it's culture, time, history, um, people, all those various forms of relativism, they can undercut doctrine in doctrine that's what the modernist fundamentally assumes right um one thing that i want to specify is that depending on how you use it i think they think modernism also means or that it does mean making things modern right yeah, and part of that, too, is going to go back to the syllabus of errors in which mm. um, you have that, that well, statement that the church cannot be, like, cannot be reconciled with modernity. It's something to that effect. And okay. that's one of those statements that you really need to pause and have good theological training as to how to interpret that statement because not right. everything that is said by the pope is infallible is dogma or is doctrine it could just be a private opinion that is whatever now Precisely. given the syllabus of errors is a church document you have to you can't just dismiss it as private opinion but that document itself is also a unique one and it has its own hermeneutics. The okay, that is a seriously good point. The um letter to the Duke of Norfolk um by Saint John Henry Newman, he goes over hermeneutical principles for how to understand the syllabus of errors. If anyone's interested in looking at that, all of his works are free online. There's a website with that. Excellent. Yeah. We should probably come back to our history of Lefebvre yes, and SSPX. Mm -hmm. So given this friction between the French bishops and the seminary of the SSPX and how you had the liturgical differences, you had the kind of the outward differences between the hippie looking priests and then these nice clean cut young men in their cassocks etc and of course questions concerning church authority now and the authority of vatican ii so on may 6 1975 bishop 
Miami, with the approval of the Cardinals, revoked the charter of the SSPX. So at this time, the charter was in effect for five years, and now it was revoked. And the cause for this was the profession from Lefebvre in 1974, where he essentially declared war on church authority. Of course, Lefebvre contested uh, Bishop Mami's um, actions, claiming that the bishop didn't, did not have the authority to revoke the charter. However, the Commission of Cardinals issued a decision that was given the same day as Bishop Mammy's decision to revoke the charter. And this decision by the Commission of Cardinals affirmed that three things. One, that Paul the VI affirmed the revoking of the, the charter, that the SSPX now had no juridical authority, and that the seminary in Econ lost its right to existence, essentially and that one could not give support to Lefebvre's cause given his doctrinal problems. Now, Lefebvre appealed, and this makes its way up through the ecclesial courts all the way to the Apostolic Signatura, which is the, essentially the Supreme Court inside the Catholic Church. And at the court, you have Paul VI reaffirming the suppression of the SSPX and the seminary where he, again, is appro approving the Commission of Cardinals' decision. So, in fact, his, the SSPX was no longer a canonical organization, which means they could not go about doing their activities, right? Yep. They couldn't, they couldn't hold their teaching, et cetera. None of that was licit anymore. However... Lefebvre continued, and this, mm -hmm. of course, led to a public rebuke by Paul VI in May 1976, because they said, we're going to continue doing our operations, which would make sense if you believe that the Pope and the, the current Pope at the time did not have legitimate authority. Now, in 1976, at this time, the seminary is alive and well for six years, and now it is time to ordain the first class of seminarians and he announced his intention to do so and paul the six gave express orders to not ordain the seminarians but lefebvre did so on june 29 1976 so when he did this um, the very act of doing this incurred a penalty called suspension ad ordinum collation. And this is in accordance to the 1917 Code of Canon Law, Canon 2373. So the 1917 Code of Canon Law is the law that the church, that regulates the church functions. This was abrogated in 1983. So during a lot of this time in the controversy, it was the 1917 Code of Canon Law that was in effect in the law of the church. Well, Lefebvre disobeyed, again, Canon 2373 by ordaining priests without permission. And so he was suspended, and the suspension meant that he could not confer the sacrament of holy orders for one year. And all the priests he illicitly ordained were automatically suspended from exercising their priesthood. So now you have a bishop and a group of new priests that are all suspended from being able to perform their priestly activities, though Lefebvre could still confer other sacraments, just not holy orders. And then the next day after Lefebvre did this, the Vatican announced that they're going to inc add more penalties. So the Vatican initiated an investigation to look at, uh, pretty much make a case that Marcel Lefebvre is formally disobeying the Pope. 
given the fact that he just ordained a bunch of priests without papal authority. And one week later, after this public announcement, Lefebvre received a canonical warning from Cardinal Baggio, who is the prefect of the Sacred Congregation of Bishops. And Lefebvre was warned that he needed to repair the scandal due to his the ordinations he just conducted, and that failure would result in further consequences. Now, these further consequences will end up being a suspense, the suspension of the Venice. And we'll get to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. So Lefebvre, when Lefebvre replied to this warning, he did not retract his doctrinal rejections of Vatican II. He did not submit obedience to the Pope. Instead, he accused Paul VI of collaborating with the Freemasons, which is a very ballsy thing to do. And we, we, that's just one of those motifs that you just continually see. Freemasons, Freemasons everywhere. You can almost make a meme out of that. Yes, I'm sure they would have if they had social media at the time. Oh, certainly. Yeah. I think that's not to change the subject. It's just that's just part of the problem with social media. Um, that I think that's what I meant. That's partially what I meant mm. in our first episode when I said that ideologies are, ideologies are more contagious. Yeah, well, social media is a tool, and like any tool, you can use it for good or evil. Yeah. Like, we're using the same tools for good, just as SSPX probably have their own podcast episodes. Using they do. Uh, yeah, evil. they do. Yeah. I believe I listened to one of their episodes. Yeah, so to our listeners, ignore that. <laughs> so, given the fact that now he's accusing the Pope collaborating with Freemasons on some level... On July 22nd, 1976, Lefebvre is suspended ad divinus. That means he's forbidden from exercising his priesthood entirely in any capacity. And this is according to the 1917 Code Canon 2279. And that is actually a very long, intense canon listing like 10 things that every single thing that Lefebvre now cannot do no sacraments, no, not even being an administrator for anything. He is completely suspended from all activity. And this suspension is something that's reserved to the Pope alone. So the Pope is suspended, Lefebvre. Is it not some cardinals? This is a direct action of the Pope saying, no, you're being bad. And now you have lost all your privileges. This is essentially papal jail because the suspension is That's a good way to put it it's perpetual and you, you can't lefebvre can't get out unless he is absolved by the pope himself which as we can see is probably not going to happen anytime soon in fact it never did so between the suspension ad divinus in 1976 and 1988, the span of 12 years, you have Lefebvre every year consecrating new bishops, or not bishops, but new priests, ordaining new priests, because every year the seminary is still in operation. They're still producing new seminarians, new priests. So every year you have this problem of, okay, they're, they're formally disobeying papal authority, you have a bishop who has been suspended of all his um, from exercising his sacrament of holy orders, and yet he's continuing to do so. And this is going to come to a clash. So, of course, um, Paul VI dies. Pope John Paul II is elected Pope 1979. And the conversations between Lefebvre and the Magisterium resume. You have uh, several letters of correspondence between Lefebvre, Cardinal Ratzinger, who became prefect for the Congregation of Doctrine of Faith, and, of course, John Paul II. Now, on May the 5th, 1988, as a fruit of this 
dialogue between Lefebvre and Ratzinger, there was this protocol of agreement between Lefebvre and the Magisterium. And this protocol was quite generous given everything that Lefebvre has done over the last now 18 years. So the contents of this protocol removed all the censures against all the illicitly ordained priests in the SSPX so that they could be regularized and normalized in communion with the church. Similarly, it was to regularize the SSPX chapels and remove the censures against the lady from attending the SSPX masses. Lefebvre had to recognize the authority and authenticity of Vatican II and the new mass de Novus Ordo. The SSPX were given permission to continue using the 1962 Missal, which was the for the Latin Mass. The Pope had the Pope would select a priest from the SSPX that Lefebvre can consecrate as a bishop. See, by this time, Lefebvre he's getting old, and he knows that his time is coming near. In fact, he dies three years later. And so he knows he needs a successor that will continue consecrating new priests, and that requires a bishop. So he's trying to get a new bishop. And the last part of this um, protocol agreement was the creation of a Roman commission to resolve further questions between the SSPX and the magisterium. And the new bishop that the pope would select would serve as a member. So two of the five members of this commission were to be from the SSPX. The other three were going to be chosen by Pope. And interestingly, Lefebvre initially signed the protocol. And so a date was set for August 15th, 1988. But Lefebvre wavered on the agreement. And on, on May 24th, he demanded three bishops be consecrated and majority representation on the Roman Commission. He feared being misrepresented by the commission to the Pope, even though the Pope would have direct authority over that commission and no decision would be made without his approval. And so he was gonna have a direct hand in that process. So you have this fear of misrepresentation and Interestingly enough, he did not want to be reconciled with the post conciliar church. Quote, so this is Lefebvre. So again, quote, upon reflection, it appears clear that the goal of these dialogues is to reabsorb us within the conciliar church, the only church to which you make collusion during these meetings. End quote. So that's a reference to Ratzinger and the discussions he was having with Lefebvre. So given the fact that Lefebvre did not want to be reabsorbed into the church, he's manifesting a schismatic spirit. So essentially Lefebvre just wanted, I guess, he wanted his own bishops. He wanted more than one of them. And he did not want to rejoin the church. Disturbingly, he makes it sound like it's another church. He does. Yeah. So that's the key. Yes. It's as if he is still part of the true church and the yep. rest of the church had fallen yep. on the wayside. You could almost call it a great apostasy. I wouldn't go that far, but I, I, I fail yeah. to see how that's not a schism. I, yeah. I, I, I use double negatives. <laughs> Yeah, I'm of course being a little facetious with the yeah. great apostasy, but yeah, yeah. there's got an analogy there. No of course. Does. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Well, Ratzinger tries to calm him. You know, it's like, no, he's not going to be <laughs> misrepresented. But he did reject Lefebvre's two new demands because already it was already agreed upon that you would get one bishop. Now you're asking for three. And well, that just was not good enough. Lefebvre 
in Lefebvre's mind, what he wanted was to, he wanted more bishops to protect his movement from the modernism represented by Vatican II and the post-Vatican II church. And so on June 2nd, 1988, he stated his intention to consecrate bishops on his own authority. So this is going to be a big problem because by this time, um, well, now it's 1988, of course, so 83 of the new Code of Canon Law, and in the, new, the 83 Code of Canon Law, it specifically states that you cannot consecrate a bishop without pontifical mandate. So he ha Lefebvre has to have permission from the Pope in order to consecrate a bishop. So on June 9, 1988, Pope John Paul II warns Lefebvre that Ratzinger accurately portrayed the mind of the Pope. So one common motif during these almost 20 years of dialogue is you get Lefebvre arguing that whoever is sending him negative messages of you're censored, you're suspended, etc., that Lefebvre's like, no, 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 that's not what the Pope meant. And then you get the Pope whether it's Paul VI or JP2 saying, no, this is what I meant. So, and he warned Lefebvre, John Paul II, that if he, Lefebvre went through this ordination, that it would be without the required pontifical mandate. Well, June 15th, Lefebvre holds a press conference and says, He's going, he announced the name of four candidates he's going to consecrate as bishops on June 30th. So on June 17th, he receives a public warning from Cardinal Ganton, who on behalf of the Congregation of Bishops, that he will be excommunicated according to canon law. So again, the 1983 Code of Canon Law, Canon 1013, says that the bishop consecration requires a pontifical mandate, which Lefebvre lacked. So then according to Canon 1382, that if one were to perform such a consecration, that this would enact a penalty of ipso facto excommunication, latte sentientiae. I probably butchered that. Latte sententiae. Yeah. And what that means is in the very act of doing this consecration, Lefebvre excommunicates himself by the force of the law itself. So in the very act of consecrating the bishops illicitly, Lefebvre automatically excommunicates himself from the church by the law itself. And of course, on June 30th, he consecrates four bishops. And in the act of doing so, he himself is excommunicated in addition to the four bishops. And on July 2nd, John Paul II reaffirmed that by this action, Lefebvre and the four new bishops are excommunicated and that this act constituted as a schismatic act. And the tragedy is Lefebvre died in 1991 as a schismatic excommunicated from the church. So that is one soul we certainly should be praying for because as the church has affirmed, there is no salvation outside the church. And that's another touchy topic between the radical traditionalists and Vatican II. That's also a upcoming article probably in a few weeks i got 30 some pages on that topic alone great um now i know guillermo was he asked me where did all this information come from and i'm sure you the listener are wondering this is a lot of really good information in fact i left out a lot of really good information yeah. in addition if you want to get into the nitty gritties of this i suggest that you look into a article called A Canonical History of the Lefebvre Schism by Peter John Veer. His last name is spelled with 
B E R E. Um, that can be found on catholicculture.org. It's a great website. They have a lot of great resources, and this is one of them. A lot of the information I talked about, I pulled from there. Yes, and Peter Veer is the individual who co authored the book with Patrick Madrid called More Catholic Than the Pope, which addresses the Society of St. Pius X and where they err. One thing that you mentioned, I'm not trying to recall, I wanted to build off of what you were saying about, um, well, okay, yes, he's committing all these acts illicitly so it's not so much that he didn't have papal approval but the but the pope explicitly said no so he didn't just go behind the pope's back and do this no uh the, the pope told him no and critics of uh sspx advocates i should say who are critics they they say oh yeah lefebvre you know he 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 wrote to rome he wrote to the vatican he appealed to the pope can i do this can i do that so see, right. in that sense he he acknowledges the authority of the pope uh, yeah but considering that he <laughs> disobeyed the pope he might as well not have right like why do you bother why do you no, yeah. no, even if the pope it's, says no i'm gonna do it yeah it's one of those curiosities where he spends essentially 18 years yeah. dialoguing with the magisterium, but for what purpose? Because he repeatedly disobeys the authority of the Pope. And I want to uh, go out on a limb and say, well, then, in a manner of speaking, he made himself the Pope, if not just made himself the, he made himself the authority. Exactly. And, and that is ultimately one of the problems at stake. Oh, yeah. Within Catholicism today is you get radicals on the left and the right. Exactly. Liberals and traditionalists yep. who want to make themselves their own authority. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a document by the Congregation of Doctrine of Faith called Donum Veritatis, which says that these people want to institute their own little magisterium over the true magisterium of the church. It's like they, they want to have their own authority over the doctrines and dogmas, mm -hmm. but Christ gave the authority only to the church, the Catholic church, not to a private group of people. But Precisely. Precisely. And I do want to build off of something that we touched on um, earlier is the fact that Lefebvre and SSPX in general use terminology that says that just conclusively shows we're talking about two different churches we're talking about two different religions you have the pre quote-unquote pre-conciliar church and quote-unquote the post-conciliar church right and okay th that um that this so-called remnant church they are the, the, the last remaining survivors of the pre-conciliar church. So they are the right religion, just for lack of the words. But this talk about, oh, remnant church. I just figured theologically, there's only the body of Christ or lack exactly. thereof. Yeah, exactly. or lack thereof. So and Yeah, no, this reminds me of a point Cardinal Ratzinger made in his mm. book, The Ratzinger Report. There's only one church of Christ yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Exactly. There's only one bride. Yes. There's only that one unique identity. And if you reject Vatican II, you're rejecting the same bride of Christ that was at Trent or Nicaea. It is the same bride of Christ. It's the same church acting through history. You cannot reject the church at one moment and accept her at the next. It's the same person, so to speak. Precisely. And the just the next thing that I wanted to touch on, I don't know if you, there's anything more you wanted to add to this history of SSPX. Yeah, no, I think that's a yeah. probably more thorough history than what our listeners were expecting from it. 
us at this moment. But this is important. It's it's exactly. good to be thorough. Exactly. Yeah, of course. But okay, but to proceed with splitting oneself from the church. Right. What what f- first of all, what happened to the Protestants? Well, they they didn't all agree on everything, so they started their own. They they branched off and started their own mm-hmm. uh, groups. Same and, thing with SSPX. There were people, yeah. followers of SSPX, who claimed that Lefebvre was too liberal, and they started their own sects. That are those would be the set of contests. Yeah, those would be the just the worse ones. Just for lack of other words, they are the worst. Yeah. They're worse. Yeah, but and the the set of a uh, <laughs> for me set of a contests set of a contest set mm-hmm. of a contest Maybe yeah the I'll sets say. yeah the yeah. sets yeah yeah I, I I type out the word but I never actually say it because no one actually has those conversations except us yeah but yeah no it's interesting that and some of the quotes I read earlier you get that tendency because back in that 1974 declaration, you have Lefebvre dismissing entirely the authority of the ecumenical council and the Pope. That's what the SEDs do. Said a vacantus means that the see of the chair of Peter is empty. Mm -hmm. That's what they believe. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not like they all agree amongst themselves either about, Mm -mm. No, that's yeah. why they have different different groups. Yeah, so some said a vacantus say they'll accept John the twenty third. Some won't. Some accept Paul six. Some won't. I've heard that some even reject Pius the twelfth, because once you start looking at Pius the twelfth closely, you see the continuity with Vatican II. Yep. Oh yeah. Half of the half of the papal citations in the Vatican II documents are Pius the Twelfth. So it's, you have to cherry pick how far do you want to go according to your whatever it is you want to call tradition, right? Yes, and but and that's why I think it's fair, despite that SSPX are not set of a contests, I think it's fair to put them under the umbrella of radical traditionalism. Yeah. So I, you kind of have to wonder whether they really are or are not set, set of a contest, given some of the statements they've said. And I do know that they do, on their website, they do have articles against this set of a contest. Oh, I can't wait to see them. But at the same time, I can't help but feel... Is there really that much of a difference if you reject well, the authority of log- popes and count- church councils? Logically, no. There is exactly. no difference. That will exactly. no wonder some of them branch away and start off their own groups, their own right. clubs, right. their own, I, I'm going to say it, their own cults. Pretty much, yeah. I, no, I, that's one thing I was always critical. SSPX, are they a cult? I, I just figured they're another Protestant group. Um, no, now I, I more clearly see why their disposition is yeah. cultish. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we should move on to some consequences rather briefly. Yes, yes, please. Yeah. So I actually, I just wanted to share um, some nice church tradition with a capital T. Given that the, the SSPX are all for a tradition, you know? Yep. So there's this um, interesting statement in the Council of Constance, which was a ecumenical council. And it, the following proposition is condemned by the council as an error. And it says, it is not necessary to salvation to believe that the Roman church is supreme among the other churches. And right after this censure, or right after this proposition, you have the council explain why it's an error. And it says, quote, it is an error if by the Roman church is meant the universal church or a general council 
or insofar as it denies the primacy of the Supreme Pontiff over other particular churches, end quote. So this condemned proposition means that you have to maintain that it's necessary, it is necessary to your salvation to believe that the universal church is supreme authority, that the ecumenical councils have supreme authority, and that the Pope has supreme authority, right? Mm -hmm. So when, you, when we recast this in terms of no salvation outside the church, there's no salvation outside the church if you reject the authority of the Pope or an ecumenical council. And we can, of course, cite other church documents such as Urban Aids Unum Sanctum. We could cite the earlier formulations of no salvation outside the church where it specifically mentions heretics and schismatics. In fact, that was how the early patristics understood no salvation outside the church. We're talking 300s AD 400s times of St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, if you're a schismatic, you place yourself outside the church and outside of salvation. So we need to be clear about the consequences of the SSPX and schism. Schism yeah. is a dreadful sin. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas defines schism as a sin against unity. It's, against, it's a sin against the unity of the church. You can read that. It's in the Summa Theologiae, um, the second part of the second part, question 39, article one. And then I want to leave one last thought. And this is from Ale Pope Alexander VIII in 1690, where the, this proposition is condemned. So what is condemned is this view that the assertion of the authority of the Roman pontiff over an ecumenical council and infallibility in deciding questions of faith is futile and often contradicted. In other words, it is a condemned proposition to think that the Pope can be erroneous in interpreting the ecumenical council or that their authority can be impaired. So the entire Lefebvre um, SSPX premise that Vatican II is an erroneous council and that the popes are erroneous popes, that's going to raise a question in my mind concerning this condemnation about the authority of the popes over ecumenical councils. Uh, Guillermo, did you have anything yeah. you wanted to add to that? Um. No, no, it's pretty, it's very clear that um, there's this rejection, honestly, this stubborn rejection. I think all we can do is just continue having the conversations if and when they come. But, but yeah. in my experience with these individuals, there's no, uh, there's no convincing. And it's not like people don't leave SSPX. Yes, they do. But overwhelmingly, dialogue is extreme it, it's challenging and it's very challenging to be yeah. charitable with these individuals because yeah. of the vitriol the vitriol that is very true yeah the vitriol is it can be rather intense at times oh and yeah that's also why on the website i try to be as thorough as possible to show developments yeah. mm -hmm. and to aid in understanding I do think that the vitriol is a manifestation of wrath and pride. There's this rebellion. Rebellion. There you go. Rebellion. That's really what I have to say about that. And there's tell that we could go into, but yeah. maybe just uh, any last, any concluding thoughts and other topics that we can address we could dedicate uh, other episodes oh, to them as course. well. Yeah. Yeah. We, we probably spent enough time talking about SSPX for one episode. Absolutely. But essentially, La Nouvelle Esprit is the fruit of 
the apologetics in light of this dissent. So our listeners, uh, uh, we hope that this was fruitful for you and we use these resources, use these resources because SSPX advocates will quote church documents. Well, here we have canon law, we have church documents on our website, there's more information. This is, as uh, in, in terms of apologetics, this is also a kind of evangelization. And I do think that the church is experiencing a period of time when the, in, I guess, the intellect or knowledge is idolized. It's, it's about survival of the smartest. You, we do not, like, we don't have to know everything or know any amount of knowledge to be Catholic. In, in other words, um, that's, that's not essential for our salvation. Yeah. But it is rather necessary at this point in the life of the church to get the, the, the good news across to all individuals. And in this realm, okay, we need to brush up on church documents and canon law. Right. I will say, though, like, as long as you're faithful to the magisterium and obedient, you don't need all this head knowledge. Yep. But for our, our purposes and our life in the church, there's a reason I have that hundred books on Vatican II alone sitting there. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Now that's, um, yep, everyone, that's our catalyst for La Novella Spree. Of course, we do touch on other topics. If you've been to our website, then you can see we talk about culture, politics, and so forth. The upcoming topic that I urgently suggest that we that we work on is the branch of philosophy that consists of phenomenology, personalism, and existentialism. Mm. This this is a this is a thorn on the side of the rat treads. They think this is um yeah. they, they call it modernist just because it's not for lack of other words it's 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 not theological but that's the, just the nature yeah. of philosophy philosophy is yeah. reason alone essentially yeah and I, well that's not a bad thing yeah i couldn't resist the spooky ghost noises as you're saying phenomenology personalism and existentialism and you, <laughs> you could we repeat that? I didn't quite catch you. Oh, sorry. I was saying I, I couldn't re I couldn't resist making spooky ghost noises when you said phenomenology, personalism, and existentialism. Oh, why is that? Well, for some people it is spooky. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. And oh, it's, this is it's crazy. That's what I uh recommend our next our next topic be yeah. on. Please be sure to tune in to just brush up on good. these things that, that, that we need to know, not just to address SSPX, but, but to address dissent and to focus on some of the background behind what the Second Vatican Council just confirms about our That's creation, true. about That's our creation uh, made in the image and likeness of God. So I can't wait for it. Of course, our episodes are once every couple of weeks so we lo we're looking to have our next episode on february 26 please be sure to tune yep. in then yep any final thoughts jeremy yeah if you've been enjoying our content mm -hmm. please subscribe to our website please give us money whether it's paypal patreon we could certainly use the money to buy more books because 100 books on Vatican II is insufficient for our needs. No joke. Yeah, no, that, um, absolutely. And of course, keep us in your prayers. Oh, definitely. It's a lot of work writing these articles and a lot of staring at computer screen time, going crazy. It's painful, but we'll offer it up. Oh, yeah. It's also fun. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you on our next episode. And we bid you adieu.
What you want me to say goodbye or something? Um, I <laughs> please. Also, love you, step baby.